Before you sit down, turn to your neighbor and say, you're in the right place at the right time right now. We appreciate all of you. You can be seated. We're glad you're here. We're going to have a great time this morning. And uh, I believe there are over 50 people getting baptized today, which is wild. But we're going to uh, read Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. We're in what we're calling the, the Beatitudes. And this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus listed eight Beatitudes. And in those Beatitudes, Jesus talked about some virtues, some characteristics that all of us need in our lives. If you want to be blessed, Jesus said, you need to do these things. And really, it's kind of opposite of what culture would tell us or what the trend would say. But when we follow these virtues and these Beatitudes that Jesus brings out in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, you will be blessed. So we're calling this series Blessed. And this is the last one of Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse number 10. I'm going to read it, then we're going to pray. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the word of God. Your word is true. Your word is powerful. Your word relates to our life even in today's time, in 2024. It's not outdated. It's not old-fashioned. But God, your word applies to our lives right now. I pray that the word of God would speak in the hearts. Whatever condition of the mind, whatever condition of the heart people are in today, let the word of God come alive. Let it quicken some things in their soul. I pray, God, remove every distraction because we're distracted by so many things. But I pray remove those right now and clear our hearts and minds to receive the word. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit and let the people hear the voice behind the voice in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So if I were to ask you today, what is the most persecuted group on the planet? I don't know what you would say, but if you don't know this already, it's Christianity. May surprise you that Christians are the most persecuted group in the planet today. Uh, it doesn't go really reported by the mainstream media. Often it's overlooked. Uh, there's a group called International Society for Human Rights. This is not a Christian group. It's actually a secular group who gathers statistics around the world regarding human rights. And they say that between 75 to 80 percent of all religious groups that are experiencing freedom violation is directed against Christians. And if you're not aware, throughout history, since 2,000 years ago when Christianity started, Christianity had been under persecution. In fact, for 300 years, the Roman Empire persecuted Christians. It was against the law. It was illegal to gather, and it was illegal for you to be a Christian, and so many Christians were burned at the stake. They were thrown into the lion's dens, and how many know Christianity continues to live on? But the worst persecution right now in history against Christians is happening in our lifetime. They say about 365 million Christians are subject to high levels of persecution and discrimination. That's actually up from 2021. 2021 is 340 million Christians. Today, 365 Christians. They say one in every seven Christians are persecuted worldwide. One in five in Africa, one in seven in Asia. And so uh, worldwide, persecution of Christianity is at an all-time high. It's estimated that in North Korea, there are between 70 to 75,000 Christians that are in prison because of Christianity. So about every 10 minutes, two Christians die for their faith around the world. And so what did the Bible tell us to do? The Bible said that we're to pray for them and to remember them. It says in Hebrews 13, 3, remember those who are in prison as, as if you were in prison with them. Remember those who are suffering 
as if you were suffering with him. So anyone that thinks that following Jesus is easy is sadly mistaken. Anyone that thinks, man, it's real easy to be a Christian, uh, Christianity is not for wimps. Christianity is not for weaklings. Christianity is not for cowards. Uh, it takes a man and woman to serve God. I said it takes a man and woman to serve God. Any wimp can sin. Any wimp can do their own thing. Any wimp can be selfish, but it takes a man and woman to stand for righteousness and the kingdom of God. So when you become a Christian, you will face rejection. You will face criticism. There will be people that will come against you because you put your faith in Christ. There will be peer pressure. There will be harassment even from your family. There will be harassment even from your friends, uh, even from coworkers. Uh, if you recently given your life to Christ, you know what I'm talking about. The moment you give your life to Christ, everybody's not happy and excited about it. Your friends uh, don't want you to change. Your friends want you to stay the same. And when they see your life different, they will begin to harass you. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Anyone who belongs to Christ Jesus and wants to live right will have trouble from others. It doesn't say you might have trouble. It doesn't say perhaps you may have trouble. It says you will have trouble. It's a guarantee that when you give your life to Christ, when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be people that will not like it. There will be people that will mock you. There will be people that will oppose you because the moment you live for righteousness, the moment you stand for good, evil will always oppose you. And so one of the Beatitudes that Jesus mentions here. One of the last Beatitudes, he says, blessed are those, uh, it, it, those, those that stand for righteousness, those that pursue, or those that are standing for right. you will be persecuted. There is the kingdom of God. So what do we do? How do we handle this opposition? How do we handle uh, this harassment? How do we handle people when they come against our Christianity? So I'm going to mention two things that I want to cover this morning, and I believe it's going to help many of us. Number one, write this down. There's a few things that you need to remember when you are facing opposition. Things you need to remember. Second thing is you need to know what to do. What do you do or what do you need to do when you are facing opposition? What do you do when they're harassing you? What do you do when they criticize you? And so let me make this very clear. In America, you're not facing persecution. We think, I'm being persecuted because somebody said something to you on Facebook. That's not persecution. <laughs> somebody called you names. Somebody called you a hallelujah. Somebody said this to you. and Oh, I'm facing persecution. No, it's not persecution the way the Bible talks about it. In fact, probably we're not facing persecution. You're probably facing some pressure to conform. Uh, you're, not fight, you're not facing, most of us are not facing any violent persecution for your faith. Nobody's beating you up because you're a Christian, at least not yet in America. But I would say to you that most of us are facing not oppression, but what I would call silent repression. In other words, uh, a way to keep you quiet from standing for truth. A way to tell you to shut up. And shut your mouth. Don't say anything about truth here. We don't want to hear that. And often the pressure is to blend in, to be like everybody else and conform to what everybody else likes, what everybody else thinks is good, rather than what the Word of God says. There will be pressure even at work. Maybe uh, wherever you work, there may be a manager or a boss that will try to pressure you into being dishonest or doing something unethical at your job. There may be a time where you're gathered with family or friends or coworkers, and they will begin to say things that are not appropriate or maybe even dirty jokes and want you to go ahead and laugh along with them. There'll be times even as single men and single women that you, you know what, you don't need to go to that bachelor party. There's nothing good there for you. You know what I'm talking about. 
This is not a good atmosphere for many of you that are believers. And so people will say, well, Christianity is outdated. When I grew up, they said, don't be a fuddy-duddy. I don't know if they still say that anymore, but back then, that's what, don't be a fuddy-duddy. Don't, don't, don't rain on this party. And there's enormous pressure to be silent, and they want you to praise their moral choices, even though they don't go along with the Bible. And so people say, don't be on the wrong side of history here. You know, you, you got to be with the trend. You got to be. Did you know that when Hitler rose into power in the, uh, in the 1930s, that many magazines, including the New York Times and many popular magazines, were praising Hitler at the time? Little did they know later on what Hitler would become. And so it's not important to be on the right side of history. It's important to be on the right side of truth. I said on the right side of truth. Forget history. And so when we look at Christianity, there are people that will look at us because we stand for righteousness. We stand for truth. And I'm not just talking any truth. I'm talking about the truth. Not my truth. Not their truth. I'm talking about the truth. When Jesus said, I am the truth, did you hear me? Jesus is the truth, not a truth, not one of many truths. Jesus is the truth. The moment you begin to take that stand for truth, people will call you a bigot. People will call you intolerant. People will call you all kinds of name derogatory remarks because uh, you're not with them or you don't agree with them. And they kind of set us up. Can I give you an example how they try? They create this narrative where they turn you into a a person that's that's a bigot, a person that's intolerant. What they'll do is, I'll just give you an example. Let's just take a a person, a secular person that says, well, I I want to do X amount of sin. And as a Christian, you say, well, you're free to do what you want to do. And then the secular person said, but do you think this sin that I'm doing is wrong? And the Christian said, yes, I do. Then they'll say, the secular person will say, well, it's because you want to control me. And the Christian said, no, you're free to do whatever you want to do. The secular person said, but do you think it's wrong? Yes, I think it's wrong because it doesn't line up with the word of God. And this is not God's best for you. But I want to do this sin, the secular person says. And the Christian said, you're free to do it. The secular person said, but I want you to say that my sin is good. And the Christian said, well, I can't say that. And the secular person said, well, you're such a hateful, intolerant bigot. You see how they set you up? The moment you don't agree with them, the moment you don't agree with their sin, the moment you don't agree with what they're doing, then you're an intolerant, hateful bigot. You're not standing for truth. And yet the Bible is going to say things. How many know the truth will set you free? It'll hurt you before it heals you, though. The truth will tick you off first before it sets you free. How many know when you heard the truth, you said, oh, that's so great. Most of us got mad. It's called conviction. When you realize, man, I've been living wrong and that God's words convicts me of the wrong that I've done. Let me read you a scripture here. Uh, there's a scripture here that most pastors don't read, but I'm going to read it to you because it's still in the Bible. Can I read what the Bible says? Yeah. Let me read what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, the Bible says, the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, those who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, the drunkards, the slanderers, the swindlers. Have I got anybody yet? None of these (laughs) will inherit the kingdom of God. And then it says, such were some of you. In other words, some of you were practicing this. But then it says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. So the Bible names all of these sins. It says, such were some of you. In other words, you were doing some of these things. Uh, If you do these things, the Bible says, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Now, a lot of people will say, well, that's not very accepting. We accept people, but we don't approve of everything they do. I can accept people without approving what they do. Uh, Accepting is not approval. Just because I accept you doesn't mean I endorse what you're doing. 
We believe all sin is wrong. Can you say amen? amen? Along with what he's saying, stealing, greediness, lying, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, all sexual immorality is wrong according to the Bible. And there's a lot of people who say, well, what happened to the love? I feel like you guys are condemning. No, God loves us so much that he tells us the truth. All right? Remember the woman that was caught in adultery? Everybody likes to use this story, but they don't say the rest of the story. The Bible says when they got up to stone this woman, Jesus said, he that is without sin cast the first stone. Remember that? The Bible said they all threw their stones down. And then what did Jesus say to that woman? He said, where are your accusers? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. Then he said, neither do I condemn you. And everybody stops there. But then Jesus said, now go and stop sinning. Stop doing what you were doing. Turn from your sin. Thank you. I'm preaching right now. I'm doing my best. I'm trying to do my best here. I've given it the best shot I can. And so here we go. When we read the Bible, it tells us clearly that Jesus is telling us he gives us grace, but then he gives us the truth. In a popular scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. But verse 17 says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, what, might be saved. So he came into the world to save people. Then it says, he who believes in him, what, will not be condemned. But he who does not believe, you don't believe in him, you don't trust in him, you don't surrender your heart to him, he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So Jesus is forgiving. Jesus wants to forget. He wants to save. But those who don't receive his forgiveness, those that don't turn to him, bring condemnation on themselves. Their rejection condemns him. So what should we do? I believe there's a couple of things we need to do uh, when our our faith is harassed when we're under persecution. So I want you to write this down. This is what we need to remember, okay? This is what we need to remember when this happens. We need to remember, number one, when opposition comes our way, it makes us more like Jesus. Now, again, this is not popular preaching this morning, but I got to preach the word, okay? Opposition can actually make you more like Jesus, in other words, Jesus experienced opposition, and because he experienced it, you're going to experience it, and in fact, it will make you more like him. John 15, look at what it says. When the world hates you, this is Jesus speaking. When the world hates you, remember it hated me first. The world would love you if you belonged to it, but you don't. I chose you out of the world. That's, where, that's why the world will hate you. No servant is greater than his master. In other words, you're not any greater than I am. So since they persecuted me, what? They will persecute you too. So it makes us like Jesus. He suffered persecution. You're going to suffer persecution. If you want to grow and develop uh, to be a mature believer in Christ, then you need to act like Christ, you need to think like Christ, you need to feel like Christ, and you're going to go through the same things that Christ went through. Did Christ feel lonely? Yes. Did Christ go through discouragement? Yes. Did Christ face opposition? Yes, he did. Did he face fatigue? Yes, he did. Was he maligned? Was he criticized? Was he lied about? Yes. So what makes us think that if God did not spare his only son, he's not going to spare you? It's going to make us more like Christ. I said earlier, if you're going to serve Jesus, Jesus is not for the weaklings and not for the wimps. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If Jesus was hated by people, then you're going to be hated. Here's the thing about it. There are sinners that actually love Jesus, but he was hated by people who didn't like goodness. There's actually sinners who want goodness. They just don't know how to get there. And then you got the sinners that, man, they just hate any form 
of goodness. In fact, Jesus said this in John chapter 3. He said, the light from heaven came to the world. This light is talking about Jesus. But people love darkness more than the light because it hides what? Their evil deeds. How many ever turned on the light and all the roaches scatter, right? They hate, they hate the light, right? They want the darkness. You said, man, I thought the color was black, and all of a sudden the black moved out of the way. Those were roaches there. Yeah, it happens. It happens. But if you, if you ever walked in somewhere or, or you've been, ever been sitting in the dark, somebody flashes a light on you, it's disturbing. It's the same way. When we're living in darkness, the light of Christ disturbs us. It rocks us a little bit because darkness can't stand the light and evil can't stand anything good. This is why our lives, Christianity, is different than the culture. It doesn't matter if we say, well, I'm just going to be kind to everybody. I'm not saying I think we're supposed to be kind. But we think the more kind I am, the more gentle I am, the more perfect that I am, then the world would love me. Can I tell you, Jesus was perfect and they hated him. Jesus was probably the most hated man on earth, and yet he was perfect in so many ways, and people still opposed him. People still came against him. First Peter chapter 4, verse 14, he said, if, you, if you're abused because of Christ, count yourself fortunate. Why? It's the Spirit of God and his glory in you that brought you to the notice of others. In other words, when people persecute you, when people harass you, when people oppose you, it really, uh, it, it confirms or it, it's a confirmation of your Christianity. It's actually a compliment of your Christianity because they see a difference in your life. They see that there's faith in you. If nobody's criticizing you, maybe you need to question your faith this morning. Do they see a difference in your life that they're noticing something and therefore they're criticizing. Second thing you need to remember is remember this. Whenever you're facing opposition, it will deepen your faith. Believe it or not, opposition creates a, a greater depth to your Christianity. Opposition actually makes you stronger. It actually grows your faith. It's like growing a muscle. If you want to get muscular like myself, uh, you know, if, you're, if you want to get muscular, if you want to look at uh, Pastor Isaac in here, if he was here, I'd show you. If you want to get muscular, if you, 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 gotta, you can't do it by sitting on a chair uh, eating nachos, am I right? That's not going to happen. But you have to stretch that muscle. You got to put some tension to it. You got to strain that muscle. If you ever gone to the gym... Most of you have not, but if you ever go there, you will see that you have to strain and stretch and pressure that muscle. It has to go in opposition in order for that muscle to grow. Opposition actually strengthens your faith. When you are facing opposition, he said, consider it all uh, consider it all praise to God. In other words, this opposition is causing uh, you to put more faith and more trust in God, causing you to pray more, causing you to put your faith in God. The strongest believers, let me tell you, are not in America. The strongest believers are around the world that are suffering persecution in greater degree than we are. I'd love to say, man, the strongest Christians are right here in America. But are you in a place where people are holding a gun to your hand, head saying, hey, renounce Jesus or die? Because that's happening around the world. 1 Peter 1.7 says this, these troubles will prove that your faith is genuine, just as gold is purified by fire and heat. So your faith, which is far more precious than gold, must also be purified by faith so that ape may endure. In other words, if it's going to endure, you've got to have some opposition. Then what? Then you'll receive praise, glory, and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Number three, we also need to remember that opposition also reminds me that I'm going to face or I'm going to receive an eternal reward. How many know heaven and eternal reward is coming to believers? It's going to come your way. I just want to tell you that. 
Don't miss out on the rewards for eternity. And Jesus says this, the rest of this uh, particular beatitude, let me read the whole beatitude here, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, because there's more to it. He said, God blesses those who are persecuted because they, they, live, for, they live for God. The kingdom of heaven will be theirs. In other words, if, if you live for God, you're going to be persecuted. And he goes, you will be blessed when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, Jesus is saying. Rejoice, he said, and be glad because, you're, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He says, I'm going to bless anyone who is persecuted for my name's sake. They're going to be rewarded if they're insulted, if people are putting them down, if they're criticized. Jesus said, a reward is coming your way. Understand that your reward is coming from heaven. It's going to be an eternal reward. And at the end, when you get there, it's going to be all worth it. Can you say amen? So I want you to look at a video. And in this video, they are um, a group of people in the Middle East that are getting Bibles together, that are getting them across the border as he kind of explains what they're doing, but they're risking their lives doing this. So why don't we look at this uh, video real quick? Right. I mean, what do you say to that? I mean, it's just uh, extraordinary that these men are willing to risk their lives just to get the Bible in the hands of people. Now, a lot of us would say, why don't they just have the Bible app? But a lot of places in the world prohibit the Bible app and really limit internet access. So they have to physically give them a Bible. And when they get these Bibles, they're very much appreciative. That's why the suffering uh, around the world that Christians are going through are nothing compared to what Americans are. And this is why here's a couple of things I want to, I talked about things that we need to remember but I want to talk about things that we need to do, and I need to go real quickly here. Number one, I believe we shouldn't be surprised that people are against Christianity. It shouldn't be a shock to you. In fact, 1 Peter 4.12 says, Dear friend, don't be surprised or shocked when you go through painful trials that are like walking through the fire as though something unusual is happening to you. So don't be surprised by the things that are coming against you. Number two, write this down. Don't be afraid. How do we get rid of this fear of opposition? How do we get rid of this fear of disapproval? How do we get rid of this fear of being rejection, of, of rejection? The Bible says in 1 John 4, 18, no fear, it, there's no fear in love, that perfect love casts out fear. So God's love fills us. Because of his love, it fills us with grace and with power. It lets us know today that we don't have any fear, that God's perfect love fills our lives. How many can say amen to that? And in 1 Peter 3, 13, it says, if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't be afraid. Don't worry. Instead, worship. So instead of worry, you need to worship. Now, worship Christ as, your, as Lord of your life. And if you are asked about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. So instead of worrying, we need to worship. And the third thing we need to do is don't be ashamed. This is why I'm so excited about the baptism today because everyone that is being baptized today is making a public declaration. They're not ashamed to say that Jesus Christ saved my soul, that Jesus Christ forgave me. And I'm making a public declaration to everyone else, I'm not ashamed of what Jesus did. The water doesn't save anybody, but it's what happened in their heart already. They're making a public declaration of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So think about this. Most of us, the suffering that we're going to endure is an insult. Do words really hurt you? No. A put down. Someone trolling you on the internet, trying to bait you and uh, some type of argument, that's not going to hurt you. So don't be ashamed of it. The Bible says, 1 Peter 4, 16, it's no shame. It is, it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Instead, thank God for the privilege of being called by his name. How many realize today that we can't please everybody? 
Everybody's not going to, uh, we're not going to be able to please everybody. We're not going to make everyone happy. We have to realize today that we have to, there's somebody that we need approval. There's someone that we need to uh, please, and that's God. That's the only person that I do this for. It's for God. Hallelujah. The Bible says, 1 Peter 5, 9, take a firm stand against Satan and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going to the same suffering that you're going through. So the Bible says, not only are we going through suffering or people around the world are going through suffering, but the Bible says everyone, everybody's facing this persecution. And again, it's more severe in other places than it is in the United States. And number four, we need to recognize the source of the opposition. Where is this harassment coming from? What is the source? Because many times we think, well, the source is my coworkers. And I'm here to tell you, it's not your coworkers. It's not your mother-in-law. I know that's pretty tough. It's, it's not some political party, okay, that, oh, the opposition's coming from there. Opposition's coming from the culture, from another religion, or some competitor. No. You know where the opposition is? It's Satan himself. In fact, Revelation 12.10 says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So you need to recognize the source of this harassment, this source of opposition is actually the devil. The devil hates God's children. How many know the best way to get to you, to hurt you, is for people not to hurt you, but to hurt your children? Somebody hurts your kid, man, mama bear comes out. You know what I'm talking about. You're ready, you're ready to bite anyone. And so, and I've seen it in some people, but I want to say to you, is the way to get the, hurt the heart of God. It, it, Satan can't hurt God. He can't do anything, but he can hurt God's people. In fact, when Jesus looked at Paul the apostle, he said, uh, you're, you're, you're not, you're, you're, Paul, you're persecuting me. Paul didn't know how he could because you're persecuting my church. It hurt the heart of God. And so the devil knows the way to hurt the heart of God is to come against God's people. This is an unseen spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, 12 says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against human beings, but against spiritual wickedness, uh, against forces in heavenly realms. So Satan knows uh, that he's doing everything that he can to get everybody stirred up, uh, to get this world stirred up against every believer, and he's using everything that he can. So we need to be aware of how this opposition or what the source is coming from. And number five, we need to refuse to retaliate. Now, this is a hard one for me. How many know that when somebody does something to you, you want to do something back? But the Bible tells us that we're not to fight back. In fact, you know what the Bible says? That we're not supposed to do anything. We're supposed to bless people. Man, I don't want to bless people at that point. I'm going to just tell you. He said, bless are you when men shall revile you, persecute you. Say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward. For so they persecuted the prophets, and so uh, they will persecute you. So when we think of this, the Bible says we're not supposed to retaliate. Romans 12 says, never pay back evil with evil. If it is possible, possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone else. The Bible says don't avenge yourself. How many know God's in control of everything? And so when people begin to manipulate you, when they cause you to respond in a certain way, actually you're giving people control over your life. You're letting them manipulate you into anger. You're letting them manipulate you into an anger response when in reality we need to respond with good instead of with evil. Let me read this last one. We need, again, the sixth one is we need to respond with blessing. It says uh, uh, in Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And here, I'm going to read you a scripture here that's very difficult for me. I think it's probably difficult for you when we think about insults, when we think about people attacking us or coming against our faith. Look at what Jesus said. Love your enemies. Are you kidding me? Luke chapter 6. This is really, this is the next one. Do good to those that hate you. 
That's an overkill. I'm going to just tell you right there. <laughs> Bless those that hurt you or curse you. Come on, man. I'm telling you. Pray for those who hurt you. Come on, Lord. I'm not praying for anyone. And this is the last one right here. I really hate this one. If anyone slaps you in the cheek, turn the other cheek. Boy, somebody's repeating it with a big sigh. Like, oh, God. Now, now I, when I read this, this is a disturbing scripture. I don't like this part of the Bible, but it is the truth. And so if it was my version, if we were reading the Bible out of the OLV version, Omar Lopez version, I would say stick it to your enemies, man. <laughs> Gossip about those that hate you. Give the finger to those that curse you. <laughs> Write a dirty article on the internet, those that talk about you. And if somebody slaps you on the cheek, Sock him in the jaw. How many would do that? I mean, that would be my version of it. I, I, went, I remember asking a leader, I was first, you know, a, a, barely a Christian. I asked him, what does it mean to turn the other cheek? And he said, well, when you turn, then you come back with a right hand and hit him. I go, I don't think that's the right translation. I don't think it's quite telling us to do that. But here the Bible says is to do good to the, for them, pray for them. This is why it's not for wimps today when we think about the word of God, when we think about praying for enemies. Can I just be honest with you? There are times as you stand for God and maybe there's people at work or people. I, th one of the things that I've learned in my walk with God is when people are in a crowd, they talk a lot of schmack. But when they're by themselves, they kind of come to you personally and say, hey, man, yeah, I know, you know, I, I, I got, can you pray for me? I got some issues. And I often had that at work where they call me over, you know, with the crowd, they're all laughing. Then they call you over and say, hey, can you pray for me? I'm having problems in my marriage. Can you pray for me? I, I'm having problems with alcohol. I'm prob problems with my kids. They, they come to you secretly. Remember, remember Nicodemus, the Pharisee, came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3. And he came to ask Jesus, yeah, we know that you know all things. And what did Jesus say? You must be born again. And, and Nicodemus said, well, how can I go back in my mother's womb? And Jesus said, you're a teacher of the law. You don't know this. He said, this is talking about something spiritual, a regeneration inside your heart, inside your soul. That's being born again. You're born anew. God gives you a new heart. He gives you a new life. And so I would ask you this today. This is something I learned when I was first a Christian. If Christianity was illegal... Would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would people say, yeah, he's a Christian. Oh, yeah, I know that guy. He always reads the Bible. He always talks about Christ. Or if they brought you before the judge said, nah, he's just like one of us. He's no different. Yeah, he doesn't. He's the same. He's like us. I didn't see any difference in him. People need to see your life. They need to see a testimony. They need to see your life change. How many can say amen to that? They need to see that your life has been transformed by the power of God. Here's what Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 38. If you're ashamed of me and my commands in this godless and sinful generation, Jesus said this, I will be ashamed of you when I come back in glory with the holy angels. If we don't stand for God today, and we're not publicly saying, Jesus is Lord of my life. He says, he's going to be ashamed of you. In fact, Matthew 10, 38, but for those who declare publicly that they belong to me, I will do the same before them in heaven. So I want to just say to you, this is why it's important that as believers, that we take a stand for God today. That we're not be, we'll not be ashamed. That people can see Christ in us today. I want to pray today. I want to, I want to pray for you. Why don't you bow your head, close your eyes for a moment. I want to pray for you.